Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The opportunities and the challenges of economic growth in Memphis. Tonight on Behind the Headlines. Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by the incoming president and CEO of the Greater Memphis Chamber, Ted Townsend. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Eric. Again, I should say, thank you for being here yes, again. Yes, absolutely. Along with Bill Drees, reporter with The Daily Memphian. Um, you are, uh, as of two weeks from today, when the show airs, you'll be the new uh, uh, president of the chamber, CEO of the chamber, taking over for Beverly Robertson. And uh, But you've been chief economic development officer or something, I think that's the official that's title, it. for some years yeah. and been involved with economic development for m decades now, right? So when you look at the economy right now, you look at the Memphis economy, the Memphis regional economy, what do you see given you've got these amazing things potentially or, or happening uh, with, with Ford and other big developments, but you also got a, you know, what some sort of economic downturn that we're either in or is on the horizon. Yeah. There are challenges in Memphis that are historic in nature um, uh, or you know, go back many decades in many cases. So how do you look at all this? What do you see and what do you hear from the business community? I see a lot of optimism. Uh, a lot of momentum and growth, uh, and we are busier than we've ever been. We've got 61 projects under management right now in our pipeline that represent the opportunity to secure another 15,000 jobs and 15 billion in capital investment. So we're competing fiercely for those jobs and obviously setting the value proposition of why Memphis is a destination of choice for these operations. Uh, what's also interesting in that pipeline is that 94% of those projects are in advanced manufacturing and 70% are business attraction opportunities. So these are companies from outside of the area looking to invest here for the first time. And, and you're, I think I could ask you to name the companies. You, you really can't name no. these companies, right? You're in competition, the, the right. Memphis and the Chamber and all the city and so on are Absolutely. in competition with other communities. Sure. Um, and you said 61, 94% mm -hmm. in advanced manufacturing. How much of that, first of all, is related to uh, Ford having started their construction here and building their plant here? Yeah, so a lot of these are obviously under project code names for confidentiality, and we adhere strictly to that. Sure. Some of these, we don't know exactly what they will end up being, but uh, in many cases, we do know the, the type of industry that they're in. Uh, what we do know out of that pipeline, 10 projects are, from our estimation, affiliated with Blue Oval City that represent 2,600 of that 15,000 jobs and uh, 2.8 billion in CapEx. So, um, you know, Ford has not announced their supplier list yet, and we anticipate that whenever that is, uh, we're going to see a watershed moment of a lot of these projects moving very quickly. So. Um, we're excited about the momentum, and, and this obviously speaks to the fact that we have all of the transportation and logistics infrastructure here. Uh, we are America's distribution center, but I think it's because of that superstructure of, of logistics that we know we can make anything and get it anywhere yeah. uh, in the world overnight. Yeah, uh, bring in Bill. Yeah. Ted, what is the challenge on the show uh, that the viewers, our, our, our last program on this, uh, we, we had John Threadgill from the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce um, uh, t talking about the challenge of assembling enough parcels for something like advanced manufacturing. Um, that, that's a real challenge, isn't it? Uh, I wouldn't characterize it as a challenge, Bill. Okay. I, you know, we, uh, even before the announcement of Ford last year, we were preparing for the build out of this and being ready for it. We, uh, we're very intentional in our Build Back Better grant application to the EDA, which we were a finalist. We didn't win. Uh, but in that proposal, we focused on infrastructure. We focused on creating a smart grid, basically an environment that is uh, adopting all of the new technology stack that is related to electric vehicles. But we also have been very engaged with landowners. We've had multiple conversations 
uh, with these landowners that are now motivated. Many of them have held these properties for decades in their families, multiple generations of families. But they see the excitement of Blue Oval City and now they want to get in the game and we're having substantive conversations with them to talk about, okay, how do we plan this out? How do we do site development? How do we map the infrastructure that exists and how can we connect into the, the utilities that are necessary? We're assessing the, uh, the capabilities and capacity of utilities that are in and around these sites right now. Um, we're, we've been talking about workforce. We've been prepping and getting ready uh, for Blue Oval City ever since then. And we've been working with MLGW. We've been talking about the scope and scale of these projects so that they understand these are high, heavy power users and we must be ready for that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that Memphis Mayor Jim Strickland has been talking about even before Blue Oval City is trying to do something with the Firestone site in yes. North Memphis, the site of the Firestone tire plant that at one yes. point was making more tires than any other tire plant in the world. Right. Um, and, and since Blue Oval City, he has talked about the city's interest in, po in that being a possible site for some of the support industries on this. Um, it, is that site ready to go? Um, are, there, are there barriers to, to that being on, on the block for this or for other things? You know, we have been taking full inventory of every available site. You know, our goal is to create mega sites within Memphis and Shelby County and in this region. Uh, we also want mini mega sites. So a mini mega site is any, anything from 200 up to 500 acres, and mega sites are anything from 500 acres and, 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 and up. And these are, are uh, contiguous properties that can be developed. Uh, so we have taken inventory of the Firestone site. It's under new management and ownership now. And we've been meeting with them to talk about the site development that they would envision for that. We've been informing them of these projects as well, talking about uh, the, the types of acreage that's needed uh, so that they're well informed and they can be selective in placing the right operation there. We're also focused on uh, the old International Harvester site and uh, the Full and Dock site uh, with the access that it has to the river, uh, the interstate system, the airport that is, that is near. Uh, we see the, the opportunity to bring advanced manufacturing back to these sites that, that had traditional manufacturing that, that made Smoky City what it was. We'd love to see a, a renaissance of advanced manufacturing in Memphis and Shelby County. It, is there, it, 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 are the Ford folks, the, the, the partnership that they have, are they giving you any indication of, of how much of the support industries they expect to be on the campus that they're developing in Haywood County? Uh, they're determining all of that still, Bill, but they also understand that for, uh, for the scope and scale of Blue Oval City, there will be suppliers that are dotting the, the 21 counties of West Tennessee uh, for access. But I think what we also are focused on at the Greater Memphis Chamber is being a regional partner to all of these communities and, and certainly to Ford, understanding what is necessary from a site development perspective, uh, whether that's Marshall County, whether that's West Memphis, you know, each of those uh, areas has a mega site. And we would love to see all of the mega sites programmed for this revolution of electric vehicle manufacturing. And it could, present the opportunity for Memphis to be that capital of, of this type of technology being introduced to America. One criticism, we talk a lot about the 21 counties, we mentioned Marshall County, the, the, the Haywood County, um, the Ford plant itself is, you know, um, what, 45 minutes from downtown, give or take. Um, that is the one criticism or concern I've had, I've heard from people it mm. is, well, yeah, this is just going to drain people from Memphis. It's going to drain people from the core. These jobs, this development is going to be, you know, not even at the, the, the fringes of Shelby County. It's going to be far outside Shelby County. And that's bad for the city of Memphis. I, I disagree with that. I think Memphis will absolutely benefit from Blue Oval City. In fact, we, we know for a fact uh, with some of the prospects that we're working with now, they're looking only at sites within Memphis and Shelby County. Uh, of course, I can't talk about those. I wish I could, and we'd have a, a breaking headline today on Behind the Headlines, but, uh, but we are working very closely with these. We want to see infill, most importantly, 
And what's, what's great is that Memphis and Shelby County already has the infrastructure. We have access to the utilities and the sewer and, and what is necessary for these operations to exist. And we're working with our outlying communities as well. I mean, we invest in every municipal chamber because it's important for us to be partners. It, it, the, um, the other thing, the other, the flip side of the criticisms I've, I've heard, I've also heard that, you know, I mean, Memphis has not had a, a wildly growing population over the last, you know, couple of decades. And that if, you know, however many tens of thousands of jobs potentially come from Ford and all the mm -hmm. suppliers, if 10 percent of 25,000 people, if 2,500 people moved into the core, that's actually a big growth for Memphis it compared is. to where we've been. And the other thing I've heard is 45 minutes for people in Memphis, we're kind of spoiled. <laughs> yeah. Go to Atlanta, go to Seattle, go to many of these other places, right. Austin, and 45 minutes is kind of how you get to the grocery store. So right. I'm curious how much, how Memphis stacks up mm -hmm. to these other cities when you talk to them, um, you know, because we're competing with the Nashvilles, the St. Louis, the Indianapolis, sure. the Austins, the, you know, for these big developments, Birmingham, mm -hmm. you know, South Carolina, all that. How yeah. Memphians can be hard on Memphis, sometimes rightly, yeah. But sometimes they can be just outright cynical and negative about Memphis. And so I'm, I'm curious about all these things, these amenities. How do we stack up against these other cities and communities? Well, I think just from the pipeline that I shared with you earlier, it shows that we are incredibly competitive. Uh, we would not have that type of volume. I mean, it's a historic high for this region to have that many opportunities right now. So clearly, and, and these aren't my words, these are words from site selection consultants, they are saying that this area is the hottest region right now for economic development prospects. And we want to seize on that, Eric. We, we think that we have every amenity, every lifestyle opportunity, uh, a lot of variety. You can live in the urban core, you can live in the suburbs, or even have a farm. Uh, it, it really presents a lot of compelling reasons why these operations should be here. And, and I think that's a, a testament to the fact that we, we are busier now than ever before. Oh, Bill. Um, I want to change subjects for a second. This is something you've talked about before. Um, there is a lot happening in this city in terms of hip hop artists. Mm -hmm who are really going national in a big way. And some of the comments I've, I've seen on social media from some of those artists is, okay, well, Memphis had Stax, Memphis had Sun, and hip hop doesn't really have a physical base like that. This happens in a number of studios, that this happens in, in, in a number of different ways that maybe hide the impact of what a lot of these artists are, are doing right here in Memphis every day that is really big in terms of music. Mm -hmm. you, you've talked about this in your previous roles that the chamber has an interest in doing something to, to change that. Absolutely, Bill. I, we see music and entertainment as a major industry sector. Uh, you know, the same as advanced manufacturing, the same as supply chain and logistics. We have been very intentional about uh, making that an, an emphasis for our growth here. And I believe as you democratize the, the consumption of, of music, uh, as it's become more digital, we want to make sure that we're harnessing that and, and working with folks like George Monger, who is focused on capturing the revenue for these artists and making sure that the support system and the wraparound services are here in Memphis so that we keep them here that they don't go to Atlanta because Memphis is big Memphis, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they know that they can have a thriving career here and, and continue to reinvest all of that talent and all of those resources back into this community. So, so what does the, to, to, to use the term from, from some of the other pursuits, uh, what does the infrastructure look like for that? I mean, does the chamber get involved in recording studios or things like that? Or yeah. how, what's the chamber's play in this? We, we absolutely would get involved in recruiting, recording studios here, much like Nashville did with publishing houses, um, and, and they still do. But we would love to see more of an independent flavor uh, because I think that speaks to what our culture is here. Uh, we do the grit and the grind, uh, and, and we would be involved in, in marshalling resources like incentives uh, to ensuring that, that the infrastructure is built out here. We have formed a music advisory council and, and we're focused on creating these councils 
uh, all across our industry sectors. But the music and the entertainment provides a, a great opportunity to understand what's missing now and let's fill those gaps. Let's talk about the, the, the production management that these artists need uh, on a daily basis. So we're, we're focused on everything from the human capital piece to the, the actual infrastructure. And, and from what I've heard, the discussions among that advisory board, nobody's really been holding back. People have been People have been right. very, very, very vocal about what it what it takes. They they have, and and we appreciate that. We need the full diagnosis of what has to be right, what must be true for Memphis to be that destination, recognized nationally, globally for music and entertainment. And I believe hip hop provides us a great opportunity for that. Well, the Young Rock is being filmed here right now. It's probably the biggest yeah. production going on right now. It's one yeah. of one of, if not the biggest, that's happened in Memphis. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things people have always said in the past about trying to, you know, we, we sort of get the movie production thing in fits and starts. Some high profile ones, and it's quiet. Then mm -hmm. ending movies. Then there's a big thing like Young Rock. There's a proposal for the White Haven, the big studio. But a lot of what people talk about is a need for more state incentives because that is how, that's how Georgia and Atlanta became so big. That's how New Mexico did it. That's how some other communities have done that. Yeah. Is the state, is, first, is that true? Do you, does Memphis need more incentives from the state to really build the, the movie and TV production uh, industry consistently? And do you think the state's game to do it? I, I think that the state has been uh, involved in developing new tools for incentives. And you saw some legislation and funding come out last year, uh, which we were supportive of. Uh, we're always supportive of increasing the, the number of tools that we can uh, have to, to entice these types of uh, creations and operations to come here. What we love is the constancy of a, a, a weekly show. Uh, we saw that with Nashville, uh, the, the production there, uh, and what it meant to Nashville's economy and, and its notoriety globally. Uh, when you have that show syndicated and it's on uh, international flights, it, it really mattered and it drew a lot of attention to that city globally and we want the same for Memphis. I think having a, a, an internationally known star like The Rock uh, focus on produ production here in Memphis and understanding and honoring his start in that industry uh, starting here in Memphis I think is great. So let's, let's look at how we scale that, Eric. I mean, if it's incentives, absolutely. We're gonna be aggressive about um, securing those and, and really ideating on new tools and incentives that are necessary. And I believe that as we bring this to the state, they're gonna be great partners and, and receptive to that. Staying, switching gears a little bit, you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier power grid and infrastructure. There is a huge mm -hmm. decision right now that the city of Memphis, MLGW, is looking at leaving or staying with TVA mm -hmm. as the provider of electricity. Mm -hmm. um, this doesn't affect, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Blue Oval, which you know, TVA was very much involved in that, and the mega site that's outside the purview of MLGW, but mm -hmm. in the loop and in you know the county and so on, uh, yeah. this decision is huge, and it's not just huge from a power supply point of view. That would be enough, but also mm -hmm. TVA does a lot in the incentives business, and like it or not, that's a part of the business that is the 61 projects will involve right. tax or financial or some sort of public or public-private incentives, yeah. including often from TVA, correct me yeah, if I'm wrong. Yeah, ab absolutely. Do you all have an official position on whether MLGW should stay with TVA? And the second part of that is, are you, are you comfortable with the process, which has been criticized by some, that it is, is not thorough enough in terms of assessing what MLGW is going to do? Yeah, well, first, we have not taken a position officially on, on the decision, and we've been very respectful of the process and understand the process. So uh, what I know is that TVA is an incredible economic development partner. They have been a part of every deal in my career in economic development. And, um, and so they've, they've been a part of deals uh, even when there wasn't a pilot. Uh, they, they actually helped us with UCLA, who came into the University of Memphis Research Foundation Research Park. And, um, and we were grateful for that. So I know that they're a critical partner and, and, you know, we're excited about Doug McGowan coming in as the new president of MLGW. Uh, we've got a great relationship with Doug, and he's been a great partner for years and years. And he understands the importance of economic development and the fact that you've got an active partner like TVA. If it wasn't for TVA, Blue Oval City wouldn't have happened, period. Yep. 
And, and again, the process in terms of, you know, this is, a, we could do, we have done the whole shows on this, but, you know, mm -hmm. the process of bidding, of, you know, going through the MLGW staff and the board, and then mm -hmm. the mayor has a say in it, and the city council potentially sure. has a say in it. Are you comfortable that the process is being transparent enough and thorough enough? I'm comfortable with that. I, I think that there are opportunities for continued dialogue and assessment and discernment. This is a big decision, obviously, and we want to make sure that it's a fair process for all parties involved. So yeah. from my estimation, I, I think that uh, we've seen the process work uh, and, and we understand the, 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 the gravity of this and, and the impact that it has. We want to make sure we get it right. Okay, six minutes left. Bill. Um, the chamber has has come out uh, with a position on the search for a new superintendent for yes. Memphis Shelby County Schools, mm -hmm. and it, it's not a position that's in favor of this person or that person. It's basically that proceed with the national search, uh, and and for those who have lived here for for a while, uh, there have been changes in recent years, but it's been about a decade since there was actually. A, a search process, actually more than a decade mm -hmm. since there was a search process. Why did the chamber feel that was important to, to come out and say that? There's nothing more important than education and getting our kids prepared for this innovation economy, the Industry 4.0 as we call it. Uh, this is one of the largest districts in the country and it deserves a national search to find the best and brightest that we can. We have to have leadership here that can usher that school system into an age of, of innovation. And, and we have to look at, at uh, all of the candidates that are potentially available. So uh, that is why we feel that the, the sense of urgency, the time sensitivity, and the scope of, of looking at who's possible uh, is, is really important for us. The current state of the, of the school system, when you talk to businesses that are relocating here, uh, that are looking to come here, what, what do they tell you? Do they have concerns about the state of Memphis Shelby County Schools? Uh, we don't hear that concern, Bill. What, what they want to know is if we're gonna commit to these jobs, can they be fulfilled? And our focus at the Chamber primarily is workforce development, and it's the full ecosystem of this. It's looking at K through eight, it's looking at high school, it's looking at beyond. And, and that's what they want to know. They want to know, do you have the people and do you, they have the skills necessary to fulfill these positions and compete and make us better? And I think we've, we've uh, determined that uh, we're doing what's necessary to be aggressive in the space. Uh, we're focused on accelerated skills training programs and our one-stop shop that we hope to launch next year. Uh, we've been doing teacher externships to employers. We had a pilot program of four. Our goal is to have 50 teachers in operation so that they understand what it takes to, um, uh, to be in advanced manufacturing. They can bring that back into the classroom. Um, and, and I, so are we producing where we need to be? Maybe not, but we can sell what it, we're doing right now to be ready. And, and from what I can gather, the concerns that, that people may have about that are certainly not unique to Memphis, even though no. we tend to think that we are kind of out there alone in situations like this, which is kind of a larger question. Um, yeah, I, you know, we, we don't live in relativity with other markets. What we do focus on is what we're doing and, and the fact that our business community uh, are, are leading from the front in this discussion on education and workforce and talent development. And uh, we they have been incredibly active. Our Chairman Circle investors went with us to Valencia College in Orlando and toured their accelerated skills training centers. They have eight of them in, in and around Orlando. And they place these in locations and they meet people where they are. And uh, that's what we feel is necessary for Memphis. And it's why we're doing things like uh, creating opportunities for 6,000 eighth graders to uh, meet with and interact with employers. Uh, we did that recently at the Renaissance Convention Center. Just a couple minutes left, and these are big topics that we won't get deep enough on, but one, mm -hmm. one is crime. The challenge of crime in terms of economic growth in Memphis. It, we, like the whole country, saw an increase in violent crime. Memphis has had a crime problem as long as I've lived here and, and beyond. Um, how much does the do the overall stats hurt, and how much do the high-profile um, uh, 
killings of, I mean, Phil Trenary, you know, four mm -hmm. plus years ago, the former president of the, the Memphis Chamber, the, the right. horrible tragedy with you know, Eliza Fletcher. How mm -hmm. much does that hurt internal businesses, existing businesses, and potential relocating businesses? So I can tell you we've not lost a, an economic development deal based on crime. Uh, we certainly understand that it's, it's something that is a, a focus at times. We, we don't shy away from it. We lean into it. And we focus on the data and the facts. We know that since 2006, we're at a, a record low for nonviolent crimes. So we elevate that. We do elevate this to the national level, but we also focus on what we're doing here locally to address this. And again, our business leaders are at the table. They are leading from the front. I've witnessed them sitting at tables with the new district attorney and the new juvenile court judge and the police chief and the mayors. And, and we're all talking about how we get this right, how we mitigate uh, crime. And I feel that high quality jobs, economic development, workforce development are the, the most potent weapons against crime and providing those opportunities for our citizenry so they have better choices. We can talk much more, but I appreciate you being here. Uh, congratulations you. on the new gig starting in a couple of weeks. We didn't get to your successor will be Gwen Fisher, which was announced on Thursday morning, yes. but we'll, I'm sure we'll get Gwen on in the future to talk about economic development growth. But Ted, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for joining us. If you missed any of the show today, you can get the full episode on WKNO.org, or you can go to YouTube and search for Behind the Headlines. You can also get the full podcast audio of the show, which includes a few more questions with Ted. You can get that on the Daily Memphian site, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next week.